Masterworks started about five years ago with the objective of making art investable and came up really with a novel and institutional way to do so, essentially securitizing it via Reg A plus offerings and facilitating SEC qualified uh, securities to individual investors. That allowed us to broadly uh, aggregate a good amount of demand. We have roughly 500,000 people engaged with our platform, and we see that as indicative of individuals that are interested in new ideas and new alternatives to the alternatives. We have developed, and my role is to facilitate really distribution of investment strategies for institutional investors, so in endowments, foundations, pensions, family offices, but also wealth managers, so RAs, uh, broker dealers, wirehouses, and the like, to get broad diversification to portfolios of art so that these investors, advisors, investment committees can get access to art as an asset class because we think there are a number of different compelling reasons as to why individuals should invest in art, and they already have by and large. So our focus is really on education. Uh, it's a nearly $2 trillion asset class, so almost the size of private equity and larger than private assets and also uh, private credit. And within that, we think there is a substantial opportunity for investors because we are the sole firm within that very large asset class to provide securitized solutions and portfolios and strategies for them. Uh, a few key components of that is the fact that art historically has had generally great returns over the past several decades, uh, substantially outperforming public equities on par with private assets, private equity, and the like, uh, but has also exhibited substantially low correlation. It's almost uniquely uncorrelated with any other asset class or macroeconomic factors. So we think that may be compelling for uh, investment committee's advisors as they're looking at exposures to broadly diversify away from the public and private asset classes that they've been used to allocating in the past. Uh, additionally, it's also unleveraged, and we know and understand the potential risks that happen as interest rates change, and it impacts nearly every public asset class and really most private asset classes. And so those elements of being unleveraged, uncorrelated, and historically exhibiting uh, pretty substantial returns while also not seeing a lot of um, contributors and investors in the space provide really a blue ocean for new investors on the institutional side, wealth management side, to get involved with this space. In general, art has historically only been investable by the ultra-wealthy, mm -hmm. and being that uh, in order to have an appropriately diversified portfolio across some of the best risk-adjusted returns within the art market, you generally had to have several billion in assets. Uh, but also, you needed to have knowledge, and that's a key consideration, as a lot of people don't know as much about prominent artists, uh, but as well the considerations of what is the investment thesis behind that. Our proprietary database that looked back at historical records for the last few decades mm -hmm. and really associated or introduced the considerations of capital appreciation in the art market helped our investors to better understand why to invest in art, but also what are the historical returns that hasn't been utilized at all within that art market. So. Uh, as you think about where we're at now versus where we're going, we're providing access beyond what had been the typical client base, again, those with several billion in assets or more, and into institutions, again, the same endowments, foundations, pensions, but also individuals, uh, financial advisors and their clients. And it's a huge uh, ocean, if you will, of potential investors that we think can potentially uh, get access to and hopefully increase involvement within the art market in a way that the art market hasn't exhibited or seen in the past. So we've seen just across the board, um, most firms have really only focused on one of three channels. Those three channels being the institutional investment space, the wealth management space, and direct-to-consumer retail. Uh, so historically, your institutional investors provided GPLP structures. Wealth managers were involved with accredited investor alternatives and liquid alternatives. And then you've had emerging retail direct-to-consumer channels across the board that have facilitated access to a broad array of strategies. What you're seeing is a lot of aggregation and acquisition uh, to where firms are looking at expanding from institutional wealth management or vice versa, from the wealth management side to institutional. You've also seen certain retail direct-to-consumer expand into wealth management. Our firm uh, really is focused on all three channels for a number of different reasons. One, there hasn't been a solution within the space, but two, we provide solutions and strategies that are attractive to each. 
as well the consideration that across all the three channels you may have differences in either pricing or uh, strategy that may lead to one area being better or worse as far as quality of the experience or the investment thesis or the strategy itself. Uh, in our case, we really look at our strategy as being relatively egalitarian, even beyond democratization, of providing broad access to this whole spectrum of an asset class where we're really only the, the only provider within this space. Yes, uh, generally, if you look at historic um, adoption across really the wealth management area and then institutional investments, uh, there's been two different cases. The wealth management uh, channel has historically focused on 60-40 with a sleeve to alternatives, and that has been real estate, private credit, private equity to some extent. And then on the institutional space, it's been a focus on the endowment model, which has had more of a focus on venture capital and certain other core alternative investments. What you've seen over the past uh, several years, even decade, has been alternatives to alternatives, and that encompasses a number of different strategies whether or not it's cryptocurrencies, if you will, another two, approximately $2 trillion asset class, and some others in, in other spaces, whether or not it's digital assets, NFTs, exposure to blockchain technologies, life settlements. And within those, the key areas that people are focusing on is that during periods of volatility and in increasing interest rate environments, the elements of correlation have actually increased between private assets and public assets during those periods of volatility. And so the core alternative asset classes that you've seen, uh, a lot of investors are shying away from them or looking at alternatives away from those core alternative asset classes because of those elements of increasing correlation during volatility, the exposure to leverage that a lot of those uh, private asset classes have exhibited, and the considerations to source uncorrelated returns.